Welcome to Game of Thrones Season 8, Crammed. Time heals all wounds, so let's get some closure on the final season that saw such a drop in writing quality that the show's producers cancelled their live appearances after quite a bit of negative feedback. But there are still some great moments in here. I have to believe that. Let's go! We open on Winterfell, where the grim allied forces of the North kind of welcome the march of Danny's mixed army up to join them, and Arya spots Jon amongst some other familiar faces. Hello. And the dragons make a strong impression as ever. Jon is at last reunited with Bran, and now it's his turn to discover how cosmic and weird he's become. Danny tries some courtly pleasantries, but Sansa has long since become immune, and Bran warns that they need to act fast. The dead are already so south of the wall. Young Lord Umber needs to get some wagons over to last half to carry back his remaining people to Winterfell. But in the main hall, Lyanna Mormont says what is on everyone's minds. Their King of the North has bent the knee to Danny, and nobody here wants another round of subjugation. Tyrion and Sansa say hello to each other. They were married once, but the Lady of Winterfell is smart enough to know that Cersei will not be coming to their aid, despite what she told everybody last season. And it's reunions all round, as Jon and Arya take a moment to compare swords. But the girl warns that she will put her family before Danny or anything else. So Jon tries a dragon and goes on the never-ending story with Danny off to a secluded waterfall for a makeout session. L no pressure or anything, but it's more awkward moments once they get back to reality, as Sansa is pissed at losing a brother king to gain a queen. And as a bonus, Danny explains to Sam that she had his father and brother burn alive. The news is a real blow to Sam, and after a word with Bran, who seems to be working his own cosmic agenda, he drops the mic on Jon about being the legitimate son of Rhaegar Targaryen. He is in fact Aegon Targaryen VI, and the true heir to the Iron Throne. But we'll keep calling him Jon. He's a man who's already given up power to save his people. Would someone like Danny really do the same? No one's heard back from Lord Umber up at last half, so the Wildling Watch crew pop in on their way down down from the wall, only to discover a nightmare scene of gruesome murder in the wake of the undead army. Ugh. Well, at least Cersei is glad to hear that the dead are marching up north, and Euron Greyjoy has returned to King's Landing with a fresh force of 20,000 men. It's the Golden Company, led by Captain Strickland. But no elephants. Euron still keeping his sister prisoner, and trying to bang Cersei, who finally relents after all of the hard work he's done. And afterwards, she admits that at least he's not boring, even if he is risking losing his head with every arrogant comment. And meanwhile, Bronn the Sellsword is about to get free Lady deep when Kyburn pops in to save him from an STD, and offers several chests of gold to kill his old friends Jamie and Tyrion, leaving his personal allegiance somewhere in the grey. And having metaphorically grown a pair last season, Theon slips in with an ironborn hit team to retrieve his sister. She gives him an appropriate greeting, before then releasing him of his Greyjoy obligations out at sea, so that he can return to the north and fight for Winterfell. Which is where Jamie has just arrived, hoping to stay incognito, only to walk straight into the boy he once pushed out of a window. So it's time for a trial, and what luck! He's also the guy that killed Danny's father, and brings the bonus news of confirming his sister's lie about helping with her reinforced army. But Jamie makes no apologies and keeps it real, and Brienne stands for him, confirming his vow made to Lady Catelyn and of his actions during their captivity. It's a close save. He apologises to Bran in the Godswood, who didn't actually tell the others about that push out the window, because Bran doesn't care about those things anymore. And so after a catch up with his brother, he asks to serve under Brienne's command in the upcoming fight, to be a true knight for a just cause. Danny is fuming at Tyrion for believing Cersei and at the presence of Jaime, but it's Sir Jorah who now has his back, before suggesting she actually make a connection with the Lady of Winterfell. Sansa is suspicious of what Jon might do for love, but it's Danny who has paused her near lifelong quest for taking the Iron Throne in order to come up here and fight Jon's war beside him. There's a moment's connection between the two, but it's fleeting. 
If the dead and Cersei are destroyed, what will become of the independent kingdom of the North once Danny takes the throne? But they're interrupted by Theon's return and bonded by their past terrible experiences together. It's an emotional embrace. Sir Davos and Gilly work well at keeping the spirits up and the wildling watchboys make it back safe. But with the news that the dead will arrive that night. The plan is to kill the Night King to stop the army of the dead. And the way to lure him out is to use Bran as bait. The free-eyed raven with the memories of all the living world of men has long been the target of the Night King for generations. And Theon's Ironborn will protect him in the Godswood. John awkwardly avoids Danny since his heritage revelation. And the old Night Watch crew stand guard together atop another wall. In the evening before battle, everyone takes a moment to drink and think on the past. Tormund tries sounding cool in front of Brienne with some old tales of giant killing. And as they warm up, there's an emotional moment as Sir Jamie knights the Lady of Tarth, a culmination of her valorous and honourable deeds. Arya and the Hound share a drink together in solitude before Beric joins them. But she realises it might be more fun to take the edge off by teasing Gendry a bit before making a move and banging him. Let's hope she doesn't get him pregnant. Sam gifts Heartsbane, the Valerian steel sword he stole from home, to Sir Jorah. And down in the crypts, Jon explains the truth to Danny about Rhaegar's relationship with Lyanna Stark and his true heritage. Danny is not happy about him having a true claim to the Iron Throne, but before they can discuss the implications, the horns sound. The White Walkers and the Army of the Dead have arrived. And so the Targaryens move up to their dragon positions on high, while Sansa joins Tyrion and the non-combatants in the crypts below. The unsullied Northmen, Watch and Wildlings form up against the night, and Melisandre returns from nowhere to grant a flaming bonus to the swords of the mounted Dothraki Bloodriders, beacons against the silence and the darkness. Sir Davos had made a certain promise about killing her if she ever came back to Winterfell, but she'll be dead before the dawn without any of his help, thank you, before taking a good long look at Arya. And so the Blood Riders charge into the night in a preemptive strike on the dead. A wave of light with trebuchet support, and they meet nothing but death. The army of the Night King needs no light, snuffing out the flames one by one. Sir Jorah and a few stragglers make it back to the main force, but it's a demoralizing hit that only swells the enemy ranks. And so the nothing closes ever in on the living, who haven't lit the battlefield and stopped using their trebuchets, which are on a front line for some reason, and the tide of the dead swell out of the shadows to pour over the living. It's a horrific sight, but Danny and John provide light in the dark and begin strafing the dead with dragon flame before John makes a move past their lines to the rank of the White Walkers. But the cold and the wind comes with the others, and a wall of freezing mist rolls over everything, isolating every separate group in the battlefield and disorientating the dragon riders. The dead seem to come in from all sides, and Dolores Ed is killed as he rallies Sam. The northern armies of Winterfell begin to fall back inside the gates, the retreat held firm by the stalwart support of the unsullied soldiers as their forward ranks are slowly eaten away by the dead. But no one is able to light the trenches. So Melisandre heads to the front under escort and after a close moment manages to invoke fire, making all of Winterfell a beacon from afar. And Danny and Jon are able to hone back in on the enemy and continue with dragon fire. In the godswood, Theon guards Bran, who wargs a murder of crows for some recon, but they don't have to go far, as the Night King is flying in on the back of dead Viserion. And with his presence, the tactics change, as the dead begin to smother the trench flames, allowing a steady stream of whites to climb the castle walls. Far above the carnage, the Targaryens engage the Night King, and it's a game of cat and mouse in the rolling clouds, as he strikes with hit and run attacks. Meanwhile, below a dead giant breaches the main gate and then makes the mistake of trying to eat fierce Lyanna Mormont, who stabs it in the eye with a dragonglass dagger before she's crushed to death. And Arya puts on an impressive show against the dead before realising she has to flee for her life against superior numbers, causing the Hound to snap out of his reoccurring fear of fire and rush with Beric to her aid.
And so within the chambers of Winterfell, in a tense silence, a bloodied Arya has to stealth video game herself past the searching dead, utilizing distractions and incredible reflex silent takedowns. But the horde eventually swells to fill every space, and it becomes a desperate run. Beric and the Hound make it just in time, and the resurrected warrior of light takes blow after blow to slow the dead, and he finally dies for true barricaded in a hall where Melisandre was waiting to declare his task fulfilled to help get Arya this far. The girl who says to death, not today. The Night King swoops down on the castle towards Bran and the Godswood, giving away his position to Jon and Danny, who engage him in mid-air combat, tearing chunks out of the dead dragon's face and desaddling the undead king. And so Danny has her moment, and we see what happens when the unstoppable force hits the immovable object as Drogon blasts the Night King with a torrent of dragon flame head on. But he proves truly impervious before shooing her off with a spear of ice and heading in for the castle on foot. So now it's Jon's turn as he stalks in to try out Valerian Steel instead. However, in an almost mocking gesture, the Night King raises the dead around them, with Jon desperately trying to reach him in time. But no. The entire castle stills, as every defender of Winterfell who has died so far opens blue eyes and stands up as a silent herald to the arrival of the White Walkers themselves. Jon is out of position and in trouble, saved only by Danny as she lands on Drogon. He heads off to reach Bran, but setting down her dragon was a mistake and the dead cover Drogon like lice, with Danny being thrown as the dragon tries desperately to get airborne and shake them free. And so now it's her turn to be saved outside the castle walls by Sir Jorah Mormont. They're surrounded, but all the knight ever wanted was to be with his queen, and he refuses to go down, despite blow after blow. Also, down in the crypts the long dead have reanimated, Jon can't spare a moment even for his friends, each in a desperate struggle to survive as the horde pour in from everywhere. The grounded zombie dragon is still flaming in the courtyard, blocking his path to the godswood. And unaided, Theon's ironborn men all die defending Bran, leaving only Greyjoy himself surrounded by a court of the waiting dead. The last person standing between them and Bran. And so it's the end. He charges in and dies a good man. John is pinned by the dragon and stands to face his fate. Sir Jorah finally falls, defending Danny to the last, and the Night King reaches for his blade to kill the final free-eyed raven. But like a whisper on the wind, Arya leaps out of nowhere to strike at death itself who is incredibly quick in response, but not as cunning. Her Valerian steel dagger drops to her free hand to deliver a fatal blow. For one single moment of opportunity that the fate of all living things was hanging on. And with the Night King dead, every white walker he had made bursts into shards. And the seemingly relentless necromancy holding over all the dead is lifted. Their attack broken in an instant. All the corpses tumble to the floor. They've done it. The living have defeated the dead only halfway into the season. And the survivors are stunned. And as Danny cries over the body of Sir Jorah, Melisandre, having fulfilled her duty to the Lord of Light, lets go of all her magic and can finally die in the light of dawn. And then comes the time for mourning, as a field of pyres is made to burn all of those who were lost in the most important battle to happen for thousands of years, and what must have been one hell of a mess to clear up. Everyone united here has lost someone close to them, and as a result, lost part of themselves. So the victory feast starts off a somber affair, but amongst the muted sounds of dining in the Great Hall, Danny breaks the ice by making Gendry the new Lord of Storm's End, whilst he was just shuffling past looking for Arya, and the people start to relax. Tyrion tries talking to Bran, because apparently there weren't any brick walls available, but the drink starts kicking in, and it's time for toasts all round. Brienne and the boys play I Have Never, while Tormund's northern crew tell grand tales of Jon. But it's leaving Danny feeling a little isolated, who takes a break, much to Vary's concern. 
Tormund of course wants Brienne, but it's just not gonna work with Jamie around. So he weeps into the Hound's ear, who's not a counsellor, before getting over it and banging a wench. Sansa and Clegane have a catch up. She turned down an opportunity to escape with him from King's Landing back in season two, but claims that her terrible life experiences have galvanized her into the person she is today. As the new Lord of Storm's End, Gendry wants to marry Arya. But she was just really scratching an itch with him last time and lets him down gently. While Sir Jamie visits in on Brienne and they finally let their guard down around each other. It's her first time and also the only woman Jamie has ever bedded other than his sister. And in the Queen's chamber, Danny and Jon still love each other and give it an honest go. But stupid Jon can't bring himself to bang Danny now that he knows she's his aunt. It would have solved everything to just get with her and be a couple. But separately, Jon remains a legitimate threat to her claim on the Iron Throne, even if he doesn't want it. So she begs him to keep his royal heritage a secret for the sake of peace. But with a cheeky nudge from Bran in the Godswood the very next day, he ends up telling his half-sisters that they're really his cousins. He swears them both to secrecy, but... <sighs> Bronn is here! The sellsword has had enough of everyone's promises of rewards, and so demands a promise of another reward. Hi, Garden. Okay. So back to the war room, and everyone has lost half their forces to the dead, making for an almost even battle against Cersei. Sansa wants to wait and let her Northmen recover, but Jon reminds them that it's their turn now to help Danny as she helped them, and the tension mounts. Gilly is pregnant. Nice one, Sam and Tormund will go back to the Wall and beyond with the remaining wildlings, taking Snow with him, who Jon doesn't even pet goodbye. What the fuck is wrong with you? Arya joins the Hound to head south separately from the March of the Northern Army. They both have another name to cross off their list, and neither is truly concerned about coming out alive. And despite their wounds, Danny's dragons have recovered quickly. So her side of the forces will sail down to Dragonstone while Jon marches the rest of the north down on foot. Tyrion wants Sansa to at least show some support for their ruler Danny, but the Lady of Winterfell immediately tells him that there's another royal option. And then on their way south, Tyrion spills that news to Varys, who knows that Danny must not be happy about a threat to her claim on the Iron Throne, and he is in fact deeply worried about her current state of mind. But never mind that, Euron Greyjoy strikes a surprise attack and manages to land three perfect scorpion hits on Rhaegal out of nowhere, insta-killing the dragon before bearing down on the rest of the fleet. Oh, for fuck's sake. It's a hideous blow just outside of Dragonstone, and although most of the forces wash up at shore, Missande has been taken hostage over to the Red Keep, where Cersei is packing as many innocent people as possible into King's Landing to create a moral dilemma for Danny. But all of this is just another step towards Operation Burn Them All, as far as Danny is concerned. What else must she lose for the sake of being the good liberator when she could have just torched the city to ashes this whole time. Varys and Tyrion are losing hope in Danny having a level head. But while they wait for Jon's forces to make it down, Danny tries a parlay to offer Cersei one last chance. Tyrion tries the direct pleading approach to avoid innocent bloodshed, but that is something that has never bothered the Lannister Queen, and she beheads Missande in front of them all basking in her status as a mega villain and snapping away the last thread of hope in Danny's head. And hearing the news from Winterfell, Jaime, despite how far he's come, finds himself compelled to get back to Cersei before it's all over. Brienne begs him to stay, but Jaime is a complex man who is always circled between the lighter and darker shades of grey. So now Varys wants Jon to be king instead of poor Danny, forcing Tyrion to dob him in. She's been in a serious paranoid depression since losing Missande and the second dragon, and the master of whispers, the one man on par with Littlefinger for actually setting events into motion for the entire series, is burned alive. Jon has one last opportunity to have love surround the Targaryen queen instead of just fear, but he fails again to be smart. And so the night before the final battle, the general game plan to take King's Landing is pure murder. 
But Tyrion begs Danny to allow the people to live. Jamie has been caught trying to sneak back to Cersei, and Tyrion begs him not to choose death with his sister. Tyrion could arrange for Jamie to escape to Pentos with her, but he must get the people of King's Landing to ring the bells and open the gates to avoid death. Tyrion is doing it for the love of his brother, and the chance to save tens of thousands of lives, and they say their final goodbyes. And so rows of scorpion bolts watch the skies from the city walls and Euron Greyjoy's fleet. Refugees are still pouring into the city instead of away from it, and Arya and Clegane infiltrate their way in. Jaime too, just before the experienced ranks of the Golden Company form up outside the city. Jon is in charge of the ground force, and Tyrion again reminds him that if the city surrenders by ringing the bells, the attack can stop, while Cersei looks on from the Red Keep, which Team Revenge managed to reach just ahead of Jaime before the gate is closed. And like a hunting bird, Danny drops in on Drogon with the sun behind her. Her attack is high speed and focused, and without the surprise initiative, Euron's fleet is crushed before she turns her attention to the city walls, burning the tower defences along the bay and playing it smart with her dragon's agility, before burning through the Golden Company in an instant from the rear out, signalling the attack of the rest of her army. Blood riders and unsullied pour into the streets and start to make quick work of the Lannister forces, followed close behind by the Northmen, while Danny continues to roast enemy forces and military equipment. And Cersei, seeing a dragon in actual action for the first time, starts to wonder just exactly what her game plan was. And so at ground level, it's the moment of choice. The Lannisters have seen what Danny's forces can do while the dragon terrifies from above, and after a tense standoff, they wisely surrender. The battle for the city is won. Only the Red Keep and Cersei remains, and the people of the city scramble to ring the church bells to signal their surrender. Cersei has all but lost, and Danny can hear her victory. But the truth is that Cersei has already pushed her too far, and the Targaryen Queen, in an insane move, begins to set fire to the city anyway. Grey Worm resonates with this on a personal level, and the Unsullied begin to slaughter the surrendered men. Jon tries to hold the Northmen back, but the heat of battle overtakes them, and the city turns to carnage. Much to Tyrion's shock, Danny begins to systematically burn the people of the city alive, street by street. Davos tries herding the innocent away from harm, as parents are killed in front of their children. It's everything they'd been trying to avoid, and the Lannister Queen finally understands that she's going to die today. With her city in ashes, Jaime tries to reach his sister by the way of the Smuggler's Cove, but Crazy Euron has washed up and fancies a fight to the death, while the Red Keep is destroyed section by section with Dragonfire. Their fight is a desperate one, scrambling in the sand before Euron delivers a hideous blow, and another before he's impaled. Another king for the Kingslayer. Arya and the Hound are not far. But after seeing the dragon at work, Clegane convinces her not to follow and choose to live instead of dying for the last of her revenge. It works, and she thanks him. Cersei is escorted to a safer place. The keep is coming down all around them, and Clegane meets them on the stairs to face off against his dead older brother, Sir Gregor. Kyburn commands the zombie creation to obey his queen, which gets him killed. And Cersei just kinda tiptoes on by down towards the vaults. And so the reckoning is here that the Hound has promised for years. Clegane Bowl, fighting the bloated living corpse of his brother amid ruin, the Hound delivers a killing strike, which of course isn't valid round here and the dead mountain squeezes the life out of him, taking his eyes. So in a last desperate play, the hound charges the both of them off the side of the tower and into the flames below. Danny, in the meantime, isn't really discriminating against who she burns. So John gets his Northmen to fall back out of the city and away from the carnage. Meanwhile, Arya is experiencing the reality of Danny's actions at street level as she tries to leave the city. Everywhere the common folk are burned and dying, and buildings collapse around them with each pass of the dragon. She's briefly knocked out, only to awake to a crumbling world of ash. 
Yet, despite this, she still tries to get people moving and away from danger, only to see them ridden down by the Dothraki and finished off by Dragonflame. And, mortally wounded, Jamie finds his sister. Despite everything, they're together again, as they always have been. He leads her back towards the cove, but the way has collapsed, and in the vaults below the Red Keep, Cersei laments their end. Jamie consoles her as best he can. Nothing else matters, only them. As the ceiling collapses down, while amongst the ashes, Arya finds a pale horse among the dead and manages to leave alive. And so in the aftermath, Tyrion, not for the first time, finds himself walking amongst the ashes of the dead, left behind by Danny. But this time an entire city of innocent people. Tyrion can't abide it, and he goes alone to the ruins of the Red Keep in the falling ash to find the fate of his family. And in the grey light and rubble, the bodies of his brother and sister lay buried arm in arm. Grey Worm is killing prisoners, and John and Davos try to interject for their captive lives, almost causing a problem before they head in to speak with their queen. And as John makes his way past the Blood Riders and Unsullied, Daenerys lands in on Drogon, looking every inch the tyrant queen that has wiped out an entire city. In her victory speech, she names Grey Worm her master of war, calls her army liberators, and then claims that the Iron Throne and Seven Kingdoms is not the end of her war, that she will continue to break the cycle and liberate the entire world, which sounds like the promise of endless fire and bloodshed to Tyrion and Jon. And with that, the hand of the queen throws down his title. He'll be killed for the treason of freeing Jaime. But he's the one man with the balls to look Danny in the eye and call her a slaughterer. And Arya further spits cold truth. She knows a killer when she sees one. And Jon will always be a threat to Danny. But it's a now captive Tyrion that has to make Jon see. He tries to claim her war is over. Tyrion tells him to wake up and smell the corpses. Danny has been lost to the madness of her own destiny and will not stop. And worse, Sansa and Arya are also a threat to Danny for knowing his secret, and she'll eventually have to kill them too. And so as Danny finally touches the Iron Throne and her father's legacy, the end point of eight seasons of her struggle from a terrified girl in a foreign land to a liberator and powerful tyrant, Jon tries desperately to reach the woman she once was, to wake her up to the innocent prisoners being killed even now and to the bodies of the dead children. If she can forgive the crimes of her former advisor, if she can stop now and have the people love her for her mercy, then there could still be a chance. But Danny is lost in her fantasy. Only she now knows what is good, and only she can build a good world from the necessary suffering of others. She implores John to join her in this, and they share one more kiss before he plunges his knife into her killing Daenerys Stormborn, Mother of Dragons, and Breaker of Chains, at the foot of the Iron Throne. And sensing that something is wrong, Drogon finds Jon over her body, and the last remaining dragon burns the Iron Throne in its grief, slagging it entirely. But dragons are intelligent creatures, and Jon remains unharmed as Drogon lifts up Danny's body and flies away. Oh my god. And so a strange stalemate has occurred. Grey Worm holds King's Landing with Jon and Tyrion captive, while the rest of the Northern army is camped outside the city, ready to attack their former allies to get them back. And in the end, the Lords of the Seven Kingdoms convene to decide what is to be done. Edmure Tully of Riverrun, remember him, tries running for office. But Sansa tells Uncle to sit down and be quiet. There's even a joke about forming a democracy, which clearly does not work. But in the end, with all of his cosmic power and no real desire for legacy, it's Bran the Broken who is voted in as the new King of Westeros. In fact, it's the only reason he came. But after everything they have fought for, the North will remain an independent kingdom under Sansa's control, while her brother rules the rest, making them probably the most powerful siblings in the world. 
and Bran's first decree is to punish Lord Tyrion by once again making him the hand of the king, and to spend the rest of his life fixing his mistakes. And to appease Grey Worm, Jon's punishment is to be sent back to the Wall and the Night's Watch. To be cast out by the realm, while Grey Worm plans to take the Unsullied to the Island of Narth, to defend it in Missandei's name, and make it their home. And so the Starks have their final goodbye together. Arya isn't going back north, but instead plans to sail far out to the west of Westeros, past where all of the maps stop. To go join the elves or something? And Brienne of Tarth is made Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, and as such completes her duty of filling in the deeds of Sir Jaime Lannister in the White Book. And so Jon reunites with Ghost and the Wildlings far north beyond the Wall returning to the one place where he ever truly felt free. And there's a certain comfort to be found in the fact that the mundality of life begins to return to the world, that things will persevere despite what we've all gone through, and be rebuilt with hope. So thanks a lot for watching guys, and I really hope you've enjoyed having Game of Thrones Season 8 crammed inside of you. It seemed best to do this one long after the dust had settled on the show. And seeing as stitching this footage together takes me ages, I also had to find the spare time. But thank you for all of the comments and feedback requesting Season 8. I read them all, and it's been really encouraging. With any luck, I'll be doing some more crams this year. So make sure that you've hit that subscribe button, let me know what you want to see next in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Take care.